We could even go so far as to ask why, if we were actually genuine about remembering patriots who have died for this country, why we would not first spend $100 million on a museum honouring the at least 65,000 estimated Indigenous dead who so tragically lost their lives defending their country here in Australia in the frontier wars of the 19th century? Why is there nowhere in Australia telling the story of the massacres, the dispossession, the courageous resistance of these patriots? The figure of 65,000, I should add, is one arrived at by two academics at the University of Queensland and applies only to Indigenous deaths in that state. If their methodology is correct, the numbers for the Indigenous fall and nationally must be extraordinarily large. As one prominent commentator noted, individually and collectively, it was sacrifice on a stupendous scale. We should be a nation of memory, the commentator went on, not just of memorials, for these are our foundation stories. They should be as important to us as the ride of Paul Revere or the last stand of King Harold at Hastings or the incarceration of Mandela might be to others. The prominent commentator was Tony Abbott, announcing the French Museum, speaking of the dead of World War I. And yet, how can his argument be said not to also hold for the Indigenous dead? After all, Sir John Monash became the great military leader he was, in spite of considerable prejudice, and so too Pemilway and Jandamara. Of course, such a reasonable and necessary proposal as a museum for the Indigenous Fallen would at first be greeted with ridicule and contempt, because in the deepest, most fundamental way, we are not free of the colonial past. Freedom exists in the shadow of memory. For Australia to find out what freedom means it has to face up to the truth of its past. And it's time we decided to accept what we are and where we come from, because only in that truth can we finally be free as a people. Sixty years ago, the scientific consensus was that Indigenous Australians had been in Australia for only 6,000 years. But through a series of breathtaking discoveries, science has confirmed what Indigenous people always knew, that they have been here for at least 60,000 years. <coughs> it makes you wonder if the $500 million earmarked for renovating the Australian War Memorial would not be more wisely spent on a world-class national Indigenous museum that honours a past unparalleled in human history. Surely, you might think, when we have the oldest continuous civilization on earth, is not such a major institution central to our understanding of ourselves as a people? Is it not necessary? Is it not fundamental to us as a nation? It is, after all, extraordinary and beyond a disgrace that there is in the 21st century no museum telling that extraordinary story, so that all Australians might know it, so that the world might share in it, and so that we might learn something of the struggle and achievement, the culture and unique civilisations that were and are Indigenous Australia. We have turned our back on this profound truth again and again because to acknowledge it is also to acknowledge the other great truth of Australia, that the prosperity of contemporary Australia was built on the destruction of countless Indigenous lives and with them dreamings, songlines, languages, alternative ways of comprehending not only our extraordinary country, but the very cosmos. 
And yet, if we were to have the courage and largeness to acknowledge as a nation both truths about our past, we would discover a third truth, an extraordinary and liberating truth for all Australians' future about who we are and where we might go. We would discover that though this land and its people were colonised, a 60,000-year-old civilisation is not so easily snuffed out. And the new people who came to Australia in their dealings with black Australia were also indigenised. And in the, ma the mash-up, indigenous values of land, of country, of time, of family, of space and story became strong also among non-Indigenous Australians. Indigenous ways, forms, understandings permeated our mentality and everything from Australian rules football to our sense of humour. As much as there was a process of colonisation, there was also this history of indigenisation, a frequently repressed, often violent process in which a white underclass took on many black ways of living and sometimes more fundamentally thinking and feeling in which may be traced continuities that extend back into deep time. And if we were to pursue this idea, we would discover that we are not Europeans, nor are we Asians, that we are not a new country, that we are, in the first instance, a society that begins in deep time. That is the bedrock of our civilisation as Australians. That is our birthright. And if we would accept it rather than spurn it, we might discover so many new possibilities for ourselves as a people. My own island is a good example of both processes. There took place there what was described not by a contemporary left-wing academic, but an 1830s Van Demonian Attorney General as a war of extermination. A terrible war of which less than 100 people survived, from whom today's 25,000 strong Palawa people are descended. To this day, Tasmanian society is shaped by the tragedy of a land where the English, as a ship's captain's wife, Rosalie O'Hare, confided in her diary in 1828, consider the massacre of these people as an honour. 